My name is Millie, and I'm now 34 years old. I have a young daughter, Matilda, and I devote all my time to her. Recently, I was asking why I spend so much time on my daughter. After this question, I remember my childhood, and now I want to tell you about it. That day was my ninth birthday. Every year, I waited for this holiday with great excitement, because I love to receive gifts from my loved ones. But in those days, something happened in my family. Long before that, my dad Morgan and my mom Rose started fighting and arguing with each other a lot. Coincidentally, my mom was working as a nurse at the clinic at the time. On days like this, my grandmother will intervene in their conversation and keep saying that we shall move to another house. I don't really understand anything they said. On days like this, my grandmother will intervene in this conversation and kept saying that we shall move to another house. I didn't really understand anything they said. On those days, a terrible thing happened. My dad worked as a big truck driver. He left work early in the morning, as usual, and didn't show up in the evening. My mom didn't come either, but my grandmother, who used to live in her house far away from us, came to visit us. Millie, I'm going to take care of you for a while because your parents don't have time yet, she said. But I really miss my dad. Why doesn't he come home? I asked my grandmother. Because he had an accident. He had a terrible accident and now he's in a hospital, said grandma. That's too bad. When are we going to see him? I asked. Millie, when your father is feeling better, he will come home. Until then, we have to wait. She sat and went to the church to pray. I was alone. I was sad and bored. I knew that my mother went to my father's house after work and spent some time with him. But for the next day, I couldn't wait for her. I fell asleep every time. And in the mornings, when I wake up, I don't see her either. By then, she had already left home for work or other errands. Dad came home two months later. Millie? Our lives are going to be a little different now. I won't be able to work anymore, he said. And I was jumping and clapping my hands with joy because my dad was always away at work and I missed him all the time. But my grandmother interrupted my joy with an offer for my father. Morgan, if Rose has to provide for your family alone, you're gonna have to cut back. She can afford the mortgage and male institution alone. You're gonna have to give up something. She said. My father thought briefly and said, You're right. We wanted a house this big for a long time. So we have to pay off the mortgage at any cost. To make it less difficult for Rose, we can move Millie to a simple school instead of a music school. This news upset me a lot. Because by that time, I played the violin well and dream of becoming a famous violinist. I had recently been sent to a musical gymnasium and I liked it very much. And so the days flew by. No, Grandma was living with us, and Dad was in bed all day long, because the doctor said so. So, by my tenth birthday, I was sad. Millie, I'll be at work that day, but we can have a celebratory breakfast in the morning, my mom said. And I didn't want my birthday to be celebrated in a hurry. So, I gave up the idea of a gala breakfast. All right. Then we will go out sometime this weekend, Mom said and hurried off to her work. On my birthday, however, there was a school competition for young violinists. I was one of the main contestants, and apart from me, there were dozens of other talented kids competing. So I was very nervous. Mom, can you come to school and sober me while I'm perform? I asked. I'm sorry, honey, I can't. I've got some heavy patience and I can let go for a minute. But you and I will catch up somehow, said mom once again. I was really nervous at the weekend. And when I'm nervous, I forget everything. That was the case that day. I forgot my teacher's advice. Didn't hit the notes and didn't play very well. In the end, the victor went to someone else. And I really wanted to win. While the whole hall applauded the winners. I took my violin and ran away from school. I went to the nearest park 
I didn't want to go home because no one cared about me there. I wandered around in the park all day and came home. And at home, strange things were happening. There were strange uncles and aunts. They were talking about themselves. And my grandmother did not want to listen at all. My father was sitting in the garden and smoking a cigarette, although he hadn't smoked for a long time before. Then, one of the strangers said to the other that we had a nice house and my grandmother's face changed. Before leaving, one of them said, The deal's almost done. This family has approved our house for purchase. Tell Rose to vacate it within ten days and give us the keys. In the evening, my grandmother was waiting for my mother. She came very late, as usual, and was tired. Rose, you and Morgan shall take my advice. Let's all move into my house in the country together. And a little later, when Morgan is well, you can try to buy a house in town again and move here, said Grandma. But, Mom, what about Millie's school? She dreams so much of going to the music gymnasium. What about now? She asked. I guess that my parents were having financial problems. I went to my mom and said, Mom, if I don't go to an expensive school, can I work less? I asked. Oh, no, Millie. I'm not the kind of man who pays his own comfort over his child's future. I want you to go after your dream, she said. And I wish you were around more often, I said. But Mom, Grandma and Dad argued among themselves for a long time and eventually decided to move in with Grandma. This began my new life. I had to give up the music gymnasium, as it was to the town where my grandmother lived. I didn't like everything about the school except for one boy. His name was Evan, and he was a bit willful when the teachers wasn't in class. He was always coming up with ideas on how to cheer up the others. One day in class, our teacher suddenly screamed loudly, then look under her desk, then roll her eyes and pass out. She collapsed to the floor. The rest of us didn't realize what had happened. As we sat there in confusion, the girl sitting at the first desk also screamed loudly. Then she looked under the desk and fainted. Another girl, who was also sitting in the front rows, started screaming loudly and running all over the classroom. Only then did we see a big fat hedgehog running across the floor. Out of fear, all the girls stood up on their chairs and started screaming even louder until the school security guard came and called the hedgehog. Everyone was terrified. Only Evan sat in his seat and laughed loudly, calling everyone cowards. I didn't like what he did. After class, I decided to talk to him. I believe that such a handsome boy could not be such a mean bully. Evan, what you did was wrong. You needed to apologize to your teacher, I said. But I'm ashamed. It was really ugly, he said, and I was glad. It's okay to be ashamed. It's good. It means you're actually a good person. If you want, I'll be there for you when you apologize. Believe me, you will feel better afterwards, I said. Evan thought for a moment and said, I still can say my apology out loud. Let me write down on paper, and you give me a letter to our teacher. Evan suggested. That's great. So be it. Then you write a letter at home tonight, and I will give it to the teacher tomorrow. I said, and went home happy. I felt like Evan and I had even become friends. He admitted to me that he was ashamed. That was really nice of him. I also really like him. I was looking forward to relying his apology to our teacher. In the morning, Evan handed me an envelope and told me he had worked very hard to write a beautiful letter. Just make sure you give it to her when she's not in class, because I'm still embarrassed, Evan said. I waited until class was over and then followed to the teacher to the workroom. Miss Brooks, I have an important favor to ask of you. Evan, who we know is... Bully has something important for you. You need to open it right now, I said and put the letter on the table in a beautiful envelope. Really? I thought that boy was incorrigible, Miss Brooks said and began to open the envelope. 
When she pulled out a large piece of paper and looked at it, she had a change in her face. Millie, you just got here and you're going to be on your worst behavior suit. Call your parents immediately. Or I will show this to the principal and you will be expelled from school with even, she said. I was confused. Then Miss Brooks took me by the hand and led me to the principal office. I would like you to include this girl in the case of the boy even. Her name is Millie. She's new to us, and she's already involved in even mischief. Look what I got today, Miss Brooks said and handed the letter to the principal. He looked at it and shook his head. Millie, tell me, why did you do it? The principal asked. I still didn't understand what was going on. Because it's the right thing to do, I said. So ugly and immoral. I usually expel you from school for this kind of thing. But this time, you will get a warning. So don't get involved in such things again, said the principal. Then tore up even later and threw it in the trash. Only then did I realize that even had thrown an obscene middle finger gesture there. And there was no forgiveness in it. I got really mad at him, and he was sitting in the last desk laughing as usual. I came home that day in a terrible mood. I wanted to be with my mom, tell her everything that was going on in my life, and to ask her for advice about Ivan, but my mom wasn't home as usual, so I thought of a way to get her attention. I called her work. My mom quickly picked up the phone. Mom, come home, I said. Millie, stop being naughty. I'm busy. I'm only be here at night, replied Mom. Well, whatever. I just wanted you to see something with your own eyes, I said. Millie, if it's one of your other surprises, I will have time to see him tonight too, Mom replied. No, it's not my surprise this time. Dad and Grandma have stripped and locked themselves naked in your bathroom. They don't know I'm home. I said without thinking for long. What? What did you say? Mom asked me again. I didn't want to repeat myself twice, so I just hang up. Exactly half an hour later, from the window of the house, I saw my mom rushing home at high speed. She burst into the house and went straight to the bathroom. But my dad was sleeping there after his medical procedures, and my grandmother was digging in the vegetable garden. My mom went up to her and said something, and my grandmother responded by saying that she needed to get her hat treated. Mom grabbed her hat and came to me. Millie, what was that? She asked. Sorry, Mom, I just wanted you to be with me. Let's go to the bar together today. There is something I want to tell you, I said. Mom sighed heavily. She was angry with me, but she kept her temper in check. Millie? You and I will definitely go to the park, just on another day. Please don't do anything stupid anymore. If you want, go out tonight with your new friends from school. Have some ice cream, she said, took some money out of her purse and handed it to me. I sighed heavily and took the money and my mom was about to head back out. I stopped her again. Mom, and you were so not off work that day I performed, I said. Mom was a little confused and turned back to me. Baby, because I believe in your talent, I believe that you are an independent and a smart girl, and I need to work very hard so that we can pay for your father's treatment and so that we can buy a new house again, and also we have to give a good education to you. She said and I kissed her and let her go. I took the money and went to the nearest cafe in town. For some reason, I really like it here. Very different people come here, traveling from one end of the country to another. I ordered an ice cream and waited. At that moment, the door of the cafe opened and my grandmother came in, limping with one leg, had a stuff in one hand that clattered on the floor as he walked. You could tell he had some problems in his life. He was sad. He looked around the entire cafe and then headed to the corner with the food that the innkeepers leave for the needy. There was a lot of food there, but the homeless man went through it for a long time and didn't choose anything. 
I became very curious as to why he wasn't taking anything, so I ordered one fish burger and brought it to him. Here, I want to make you feel good, I said and held it out. The old man looked me in the eye and smiled. Thank you, sweet girl, but I don't like burgers. I like a cake, but no one left it in the charity box today, he said. I thought adults didn't like sweets, I said, but it's my birthday today. I want to make it special, said the old man. Then I took one dollar out of my money and held it out to him. I congratulate you. Buy yourself something. The old man smiled once more and walked away. From that day on, I came to that cafe more and more often. It was interesting for me to study different people. They reached out to me, too. They gave me nice gifts or were interested in my violin. But every time I tried to do something nice for the old man who had a birthday, I felt sorry for him. My birthday, too, were lonely and boring. One such day, I saw him away from the cafe building. He had laid cardboard on the pavement and was sitting on it. Hey! Why don't you come to the cafe? I'll buy you a drink, I said. Thank you, good girl. But it's not easy for me. My stuff was taken away by the Williams, and it's hard for me to walk without it, he said. That's terrible. We shall report to the police. Let them punish the hooligans, and I will buy you new stuff. My mom gave me money, I said. No, sweetheart, no thanks. No need to buy it. Those bastards over there. They are gonna use it for their game. Maybe they will give it back, said the old man and pointed to the crowd of kids. The one who was holding the old man's stuff and doing something with it, I recognized immediately. It was Ivan. I silently approached him and asked him to give me the stuff, to which he said it was none of my business. That was the last throw of my patience. I woke up to him and slapped him, and his friends laughed. The stuff fell out of his hands. I picked it up and brought it to the old man. He thanked me. And that night, I sorted out my feelings for even. I couldn't be friends with a scumbag like that. I decided to get out of my head and stop saying hello to him in the morning. I kept going to the cafe to eat ice cream and just sit there, watching other people. But I never met the old man with a limp again. Six months went by, and he never showed up. I thought he'd gone somewhere. Then, in the spring, I suddenly saw him again. He was sitting not far from the cafe with a book covering his face. Without thinking long, I went and got a burger and a drink, sat it down next to him, and pushed him lightly with my hand. His book fell off his face, and he seemed a little startled. Hey, haven't seen you around here in a while, I said. Hey. Did you remember me? The old man was surprised. Yeah, I remember everyone I've ever met. Help yourself to a fresh burger and a drink, I said. Thank you, but why do you give me a treat every time? He asked. I just wanted to do something nice. It's nice when people feel that they are not alone in the world, that someone is ready to take care of them too, I said. He put the burger aside and asked me a lot of other things. I was happily to tell him all about my school, that I played violin, and that I had been doing so badly lately. I also told him that I missed my musical gymnasium, where all my friends had stayed. If you were a wizard, what will you do? He asked suddenly. I will fire my mom from her job so she could be there for me. I'll fix my dad so my mom wouldn't have to be away at work, I said. The old man stroked my head and said, Where can I see your mom? I can deal her number. I said and dealed her. When my mom picked up the phone, she heard this. Miss Rose, hello there. It is Mark Swift, founder of the Lone Star. May I take your daughter on a tour of one of our company's tours? He asked. My mom seemed a little confused. And then she answered something. Then she asked me to put her on the phone. Mom, this man is an old friend of mine. Let's go on a tour with him, I said. My mom promised we'd go to Mark's next weekend. Until then, I really thought he was a homeless man.
It turned out that Mark just liked to be around ordinary people and socialize with them. I had never been to his chain of stores before. When my mother and I came in, he met us and said, Millie, you have exactly two minutes to type anything you like in here. It'll be my gift to you. It was full of different gadgets, toys and other tech, but none of it really applied to me. So I went to him. Do you really want to make me feel good? He simply spread both hands to the sky and made it clear that he was absolutely sincere. Then, help me get back to my music gymnasium, I said. Mark silently pulled something out of his pocket, wrote some numbers on it, then handed it to my mom. It's the cost of your daughter's education for the remaining eight years. She deserves it, he said. My mom was worried. But I was the happiest in the world, and I never saw Mark anywhere else.